So again, everyone needs some support. Understandable, and we've covered a lot of this. One thing that we found is amazing, if you go to our, our, our Facebook page, there's a young lady, a picture of a young lady there. And she was uh, 15 or 16 when she got into our practice, and she was in a mess. She was getting kicked out of school, she had horrible behavior, she was somewhere on the spectrum, and she was a mess. And they wanted, she wanted an iPad. Her parents wanted her to have an iPad so she could communicate better. And the school refused to pay for it. Some rule that they couldn't buy technology and who was going to own it. It was like a dog, you know. They're going to have to buy kibbles and bits for the dog. No, but so so we 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 went through due process and we got her an iPad. And she now teaches at Bowling Green. That she's an amazing young woman, and she's on our Facebook page at the top of the post. So check it out. It's a great story. Such technology is magic. It it makes a huge difference in people's lives. And there's lots of resources out there. If you need help with that, call us. Um, next slide. So this is supported decision making. And this is sort of a circle of friends, but with a legal component. Um, instead of a guardianship, you go and you, get a meet you have these meetings, and everybody agrees on what, where there needs to be a legal element in place and where there needs to be these other elements in place. And you build a support plan for the person. And then that gets journalized in the court. So there's not a guardianship, it's like a settlement almost. Or some courts are using mediation and guardianships now, Stark is, I know. Uh, I don't believe Cleveland has started that, but they might have recently. So it's a really good idea, actually, because it's basically family court. You know, it's like domestic relations court, which I, I hated when I was doing that stuff. It's, so, so, but, but supported decision making, it's, it's, it's a formal process. Ohio doesn't officially recognize it, but we've had a couple of cases where we've been able to use it. Um, it, it. Again, it's a formalized plan. You identify the supporters in areas of needs, like we talked about in terms of identifying uh, uh, assets first and then supports. Um, and it, it's flexible. It can change as needed. OK, let's do a little how-to, a little more how-to. Next slide. So I, I don't want to be misleading about supported decision making. It's brand new. There's some uh, really aggressive programs out there. There's a, the um, ARC has some programs. There's a federal grant that's being managed out of Virginia uh, uh, that's called the Quality Trust. And they have a program there where they'll come into your state and help with a case so that you get a supported decision making uh, established. But it's, it's brand new. If you went up to most probate judges and said, I want to do a supported decision making as an alternative guardianship, they just kind of look at you funny. Um, so I don't want to mislead on that. So releases and authorized representatives, we talked a little bit about that. You can sign the form. It can be, the, the reason we like it from the point of view of the person with a disability is it can be revoked at any time. If I don't like what you're doing, I can revoke that, that, that power or that uh, release. Um, and the durable health care power of attorney, um, that's a form that the state legislature created. It's available on the State Bar Association. Again, the only issue with durable health care is, is somebody might question whether the person had the capacity to say, I want my dad to make, to make my health care decisions at the point where they sign the form. So there's ways to do that. You have a couple of witnesses. You have a video camera like we have in the back here. And, and you have the person say, I want my dad to make my health care decisions, and then sign the form. So there's, there's tricks you can use to preserve the notion that the person actually understood the decision. And that's all you really have to show. You, you, it's not a psychological test. It's that the person understood the decision they were, make, were making and were able to communicate it. So that's a really good tool. Um, I mentioned, I, I covered protection orders. Next slide, I'm sorry. I, I, I went over this. This is a little bit more information about this. Um, I will say for the people 60 and older for elders, Ohio is the second or third worst funded state in the country on that. They boosted some money last year, but our county protective services for people 60 and older are very weak. And it depends on whether the county has an aging levy or not, whether they really do it well. But every county has someone who's assigned to adult protective services 60 and over, that regardless of whether the person has a disability or not. But they have to be incapacitated at, at the same time. So. So a little bit more about protective orders. Next slide. Trust we talked about. You need to have an attorney draft that up. It's basically you become the trustee for the person's assets. 
and they become the beneficiary of the trust and that separates them from their money legally, which can be helpful if you're trying to qualify them for Medicaid. You really need to do a special needs trust if you're trying to use it for an eligibility for Medicaid situation. Um, otherwise, there's a five-year waiting period uh, for transfers. And it's, it's fairly complex, so I wouldn't try to do it without a lawyer, frankly. And I would try to find somebody who's specialized in the elder law, uh, a certified elder law specialist, because they know that stuff pretty well. Um, and then next, powers of attorneys. We talked about them a little bit already. Primarily, we're looking at health care powers of attorneys here. You can have a power of attorney for anything anything that's a legal transaction. So I can have the power of attorney and tell, tell, tell my bank, for example, that I want to have my dad uh, manage, help manage my bank account. The simpler way to do that is just have a joint account. I think most banks try to be really helpful in that area. Um, the, only, the only technical thing about powers of attorney is if you're going um, to transfer real estate, there's some additional requirements in terms of having it notarized and having uh, the power of attorney recorded, but that's if you're going to transfer real estate. Everything else you can do it just with the form. The, and the notion of an education power of attorney is interesting because you can already sort of pick, have, you, already, you have a right under IDEA to have someone help you, to have a representative. You have a right to legal counsel as well. So even if the person's over 18 and doesn't have a guardian, they can designate you First of all, they can give you access to their records, and secondly, they can designate you as their parent to be involved. You're, you're going to be involved through 21 anyway because that's what the law says. But then after that, um, you know, some kids still go on past 21. There's lots of ways to get at that, but you just need to think about it for 10 seconds. An education power of attorney, I have to tell you, is not a time-tested or legally tested concept, but it does, does put forth the idea that my, my son wants me to be their representative, and here's a legal document that says that. And you might, you might get away with it. Um, a, a technical thing, durable. Um, durable doesn't mean that the paper is really tough and you can run over it with your car. It means, it, it's a term of art that means uh, it, it continues in force even if the person becomes incapacitated. That's not, as, that's not as relevant for this population as it is for elders. Uh, springing means that it only comes into effect when the person becomes incapacitated. So healthcare powers of attorneys are springing durable powers of attorney. They don't come into effect until the person becomes incapacitated and they survive the incapacity of the, uh, the declarant. More than you needed to know. You can find those forms at the OSBA website. We should put, the, we should put that in here. We'll, we'll add that. Next slide. Rep payee is a, a really common tool because what asset do most people with IDD have? Uh, what? Social Security. So um, there are some rules you have to follow. Um, it doesn't allow you to be in control of other money. And conversely, guardianship does not allow you to be in control of Social Security. So you have to be a guardian and a rep payee if you want to manage the person's Social Security money. Talked about, cons next slide, sorry. Talked about conservatives. It's a little different. It's mostly for people with physical in infirmities. Um, same power, same hoops you got to jump through. Next slide. The advantage is the person can terminate it through written notice. Or it terminates if the court finds the person to be incompetent. So again, with elders who are, so circumstances are changing, a conservatorship uh, can be turned into a full-blown guardianship. Next. We've covered a lot of this already. So guardianship of the estate is the finances and the property. It's much more complex. The guardian of the person is everything else. So a couple questions. Can the guardian of the person, because most, most people with IDD have guardians of the persons only. Can they sign a lease in order to rent an apartment under the waiver program? There's two answers. What happens in day-to-day -day life is yeah. What the law really requires is no. You almost technically have to go get an attorney, uh, a power uh, guardian of the estate in order to be able to execute a contract, which is what a lease is, to get a leasehold. So we're trying to get the legislature to change the law about that. because, And we're working with APSI because they're guardian of the person of about 
6,000 people, and a lot of them are on waivers, and the regulations require that they have a landlord-tenant relationship with the, the person where they live, and yet APSI can't sign, can't sign the lease, so we're trying to get that changed. And then the second question, can the guardian of the person apply for Medicaid benefits uh, because that involves money? And, and the uniformly accepted answer is yes, because you're taking care of a benefit for that person and you're not getting any cash benefit from it. So as a guardian of the person, you can apply for Medicaid and other, and other benefits. Next slide, thank you. There's different kinds of guardianships. We touched on that, emergency guardian, interim guardian. Emergency guardian has to be a significant risk of harm to the person. It's done without notice. It lasts 10 days now, I think, and then they have to have a hearing. Um, interim guardian is uh, if, you've some, if a guardian resigns and there's no guardian per se, the court can appoint someone else to be the interim guardian without going through a lot of hoops at, while they come back around to find a permanent guardian for the person. Um, Co-guardians, common, a lot of times you'll have a guardian of the person and the bank or somebody else will be a guardian of the estate. Uh, Co-guardians, limited guardianship we've talked a great deal about. Uh, under the, both the DD statute and the rule of superintendence, you cannot be a provider of services and be a guardian. It is considered an absolute conflict of interest. Families are exempted from that. Next slide. So this is all the hoops you've got to go through. You can, m most probate courts in the state now, certainly the, the, the state forms are on the Supreme Court's website, the Ohio Supreme Court's website. Most probate courts in the state have local forms that they've adopted because they want to get more information or different information than the state form. So most county probate courts have their forms online and you can go get them. Um, so you have to fill out the forms, you have to put the packet together, you have to get a background check. You have to pay the filing fee. Um, you have to get a statement of expert evaluation. And that, that's, that's a tricky one. Um, the first thing that'll happen if somebody calls me and says, I, my parents or my, my somebody's going to file for guardianship, I'll call that person's care provider and remind them that they can't talk about his care. He ha that's HIPAA. Unless you have a release from my client, you can't fill out the statement of expert evaluation. Now the trick is, just to be honest, you can file the application without the statement and you can explain why you don't have a statement and the court has to accept the application. But it's a way to slow things down on my part. Um, next slide. The court has to have a hearing. There's this court investigator that goes out and serves the papers on the alleged incompetent. That's usually somebody employed by the court, but in small counties sometimes they'll be employed by the Children's Services Board or the Juvenile Court or something else. But they're trained to, to go out, talk to the person. They do a, a little bit of an assessment and they report back to the court. And the other thing that they do is they report whether the person wants to oppose the guardianship and whether the person wants counsel. So there's some important due process protections in place. Um, they have to have notice to the next of kin and they have to wait seven, at least seven days to have the hearing. And most courts, it takes weeks to get a hearing scheduled, particularly in the urban counties. There was just a case out of Stark County this week where the Court of Appeals threw a guardianship out because the person had filed for the guardianship and the court ordered the guardianship in the same, the same day without the notice to the ward. So the appellate courts take that kind of seriously because it's basic jurisdiction and due process. So if the court, the court appoints the guardian, they uh, issue what are called letters of guardianship, and that's the official document that says you're the guardian. And you can show that to banks and everybody else, and, and they have to honor it. Um, you have to go take, take the course. And then one of the things that you'll learn is that the court is a superior guardian. The judge makes, is the final decider of everything about the guardianship. So if there's a conflict, the judge makes the decision. If you want, the, the rules require now that this has not been the case until recently. If you want to move your person to a new residential setting, you have to go back to the court and get permission to do that. Now, most courts are pretty informal about that. A lot of times you'll just meet with a magistrate and talk about it, but that's required. Um, the, the ward, the person who's the incompetent, has a right to appeal that decision, like what I just described, to the Court of Appeals. They have a right to counsel 
to help them appeal that decision. So this can drag out for a while. Um, I would say most people that appeal them don't win. Uh, probate judges are given a great deal of deference by the appellate courts because of their specialized knowledge and expertise. Um, and most courts try really hard to follow the rules. Uh, they try really hard to follow the rules. Sometimes circumstances dictate otherwise. Next slide. And then once the guardianship is in place, you have to file annual reports and a plan. Um, you have to show, uh, file a statement from an expert that the person is still incompetent, still in need of guardianship. And the ward's allowed to request annually a review. Um, depending on how the ward phrases that request, the burden can be back on the guardian to show that the need for guardianship still exists. In other words, you've got to go back and prove incompetence and prove need for guardianship. Um, most of that's done informally. Uh, a lot of what we talked about here today doesn't happen unless there's conflict. Somebody disagrees with the decision, and then these form, more formal processes come into place. Most of it's pretty informal, and, and just you file the papers and you're done. If you have a, an estate uh, guardianship, you have to file an accounting every year as well of the, of the assets of the, uh, the estate. Uh, 